Hello, everybody, and welcome into module number four. Today, we are going to be starting our second unit for the course, which is Contemporary Media Environments. Our first unit was Communication and Entrepreneurship, which was the first track in Com Studies. And now we're going to be talking about the second track, which is Contemporary Media Environments. For this module, we're going to be talking about fake news, media bias, and misinformation. This is a very prominent topic over the last probably 10 years or so, although we will learn that it goes back way longer than that. But hopefully this is something that you've encountered quite a lot of, and you are interested to learn more about how we can you know, potentially be more responsible with the information that we're sourcing online. So for, in my opinion, the ability to differentiate between information that would be reliable and unreliable is a key skill for pretty much anybody, but especially for all of you as communications professionals. So when you enter into the working world, this will be very important. But even right now as students, as you're doing research papers and projects, that this is very important for you guys right now. And the world, unfortunately, the world of data and statistics and information, it is rife with stuff that is just not correct. And we're going to be talking about misinformation. We're going to be talking about disinformation, the differences. Sometimes this is intentional. The wrong information being put out there is done for a specific reason. Sometimes it's even a very evil reason. And so as communication professionals, as responsible citizens, we must all work to separate the fact from the fiction. So let's start with part one, which is the rise of fake news. I want to quick do a brainstorm activity. I'm wondering what is the craziest news story that you've ever heard? And what makes the story so outrageous that it comes to your memory? Uh, was it a specific aspect of it? Was it the subject? Was it the person involved? And when you first heard the story, did you even believe that it was true? Was there a story that was so outrageous that you said there's no way that that's true and it, it turned out to be true? So let's start with some definitions. And interestingly, um, there is a very key differentiation between misinformation and disinformation. They are often used, I think, in the same uh, realm, but they are they are not the same thing. So with misinformation, it's incorrect or misleading information. Sometimes this is done completely by accident. It could be an error, it could be a typo, it could be an honest mistake. It does not mean that it was deliberately incorrect. So misinformation is just simply, it's wrong. Now, disinformation is deliberately wrong information that's spread to deceive people. So this is, we know it's wrong and we're still gonna share it out because we wanna have something happen as a result. It's not just simply it was wrong, our bad. Um, it's never done by mistake. Disinformation is always spread for some purpose, whether that's to cause harm, deception, confusion, um, reputational harm, or set an agenda, which we're going to be talking about later on in the slides. But that is your key difference. Misinformation, often accidental. Disinformation, never accidental. And here's an actual example of both. So um, a, a fun little fact of misinformation was that in 1948, we had a presidential election, and Harry Truman, of course, won the election, but the Chicago Daily Tribune incorrectly published the headline, Dewey Defeats Truman, uh, which, of course, was not the actual result. Truman had, in fact, defeated Dewey, but this was a very famous um, event, and this is a very famous photograph of Harry Truman with the headline in the paper that was, of course, incorrect. And so this is a kind of just a mistake. This is an example of misinformation. As soon as the paper printed it, they, of course, realized their mistake. But back then it was too late. The papers were already, you know, in the paper boxes. And so they kind of all had a laugh about it. It wasn't done intentionally. Now, disinformation is different. Disinformation is, if you ever are in the checkout aisle at the grocery store and you see all those terrible tabloid news you know, magazines with these ridiculous headlines and pictures. Um, those are examples of disinformation. So it's deliberately spreading false information, whether it's to generate buzz, sell papers, you know, clickbait um, is an example of that, create confusion, cause reputational damage for the person that's mentioning it. 
And interestingly, you might wonder how are you know papers like this able to publish these ridiculous claims and headlines that are obviously fake. And I think the best explanation I could find was that they're usually so ridiculous and stupid that the celebrity involved is not going to go through the time and effort and money to sue you know the National Enquirer or the Weekly World News. So they just leave it alone. So you know the papers just continue to do it because they're they're not going to probably be called out because it's just not worth the effort. So there is a good example of, of both of the uh, misinformation and disinformation. This is a helpful little graphic I found that um, I think shows a good explanation of kind of the different types and, and kind of the different, I guess, purposes. So, you know, satire, we think of the onion, um, you know, the Babylon Bee, these kind of obviously jokey publications, some of which are, are very funny. Um, however, sometimes certain people think they're real and that kind of gets a little bit scary. Um, you know, another big one is imposter content. When somebody makes a fake website that's meant to look like a real news source and it's used to spread nonsense basically. So um, this is something you could maybe refer to. Moving on to fake news. Uh, a fun little fact is that fake news, the term itself dates all the way back to the 1890s. It was used to describe sensational reports in the newspaper that were very common uh, in order to just straight up sell papers. This is not something that was invented in the, in the 2015s, um, you know, as a result of the 2016 election. This is a much, much longer used term, um, fake news. And of course, social media, as great of a tool as it is, it is one of the key factors in the absolute historic all-time highs of, you know, fake news and, and mis- and disinformation in our world today. What is the point of having any of these occur? Uh, what is the point of fake news, misinformation, and disinformation? Well, we mentioned a couple of these already, but there, there's often always an aim. Now, with misinformation, again, it's, it's often a mistake, but disinformation could have any one of these purposes. Um, making money through ads, we mentioned clickbaity, you know, propaganda is kind of the extreme end, uh, to deceive, to advance certain political or military goals, to try to get people against somebody, to vote against someone else, or agenda setting. Some of you might have heard the term agenda setting, you might not know what it is, we're going to define it because it's a very important term for all media and communications professionals, because it's, I think it's very hard to find a person or a source um, that does not have some sort of agenda, especially in the media. So the agenda setting theory is this idea that the media, uh, because they have an ability to influence and they have an ability to essentially pick and choose what they cover, uh, they do play a pretty big role in what's going to attract people's attention. Now, that's not just viewers. That could be governments. That could be foundations. That could be militaries. You know, the media can decide what they cover, right? CNN can decide what they what stories they want to cover, and therefore they can have certain stories get more attention, or they can ignore stories, and people won't see them, at least from that network. So it argues that the media always affects, but in some cases manipulates, um, the presentation of reports and issues. And one of the ways that they can do this is a process called framing, which we're going to show on the next slide. But maybe just think about this for a second. Maybe think about, you know, do you watch any news agency um, where you can just right off the bat say, oh, yeah, I know what their agenda is. They're clearly on, on one end of the other, spec one end of the spectrum or the other. Um, or is there, a, you know, a topic that they're always covering or not covering? So let's talk about framing. So framing, just think of a picture frame. Think of a picture frame that's hollow in the middle. It's this idea that um, in journalism and in media, we can support or the news agency or the media group can support an agenda by framing certain issues in certain ways. So they can use specific words, they can use specific images, sections of a story that can change the reader's view but not change the actual facts of the story or of the picture. So this is a really interesting example of framing. And I mentioned, just think about it like literally a square, like a picture frame. So if you took the red lines away from this picture, you see uh, clearly what is a soldier giving water to 
looks like an enemy soldier in another uniform and there's another soldier here that has his gun probably over his shoulder um probably not deliberately holding it to his head if you just drew the frame around this particular portion it would look like the soldier is holding a gun to this man's head and they're kind of holding him you know about to be executed if you drew a frame around this portion you would clearly see you know this person who's delivering water so it's literally it's the same image it's just how do you take certain chunks and technically not change the facts, but you clearly change the perception. Here's some uh, more tangible examples of framing too. You know, certain terms that are used by different media outlets or people or politicians or even people in your life. Um, the idea of, of an undocumented immigrant versus an illegal immigrant, they technically mean the same thing, but they kind of create i think two very different images when you say them um a lot of people don't know that the affordable care act and obamacare are the same thing um when people say obamacare if they don't like obama they're gonna not like that even though if you said affordable care act they might not even make the connection that it's the obamacare as well protester versus rioter this was a you know big thing a couple years ago depending on who you talk to are they protesters are they rioters um, this is a, a fun one. If you go to the grocery store, would you consider a difference between beef that is 80% lean or that's 20% fat? Does one make you feel a little bit better or worse than the other? Uh, scavenger versus looter. This was pretty big after the Hurricane Katrina event where people were, you know, finding supplies. Uh, were they scavenging? Did they just happen across it or were they looting? Were, were they stealing? Everybody, you know, was using different terms. Um, a demonstration versus an uprising. You know, those that's a that's a pretty interesting one. And then drugs versus medication. They again, if you look at both of these uh, examples, they conjure, I think, very different images. Can you think of any other examples of framing or agenda setting that you've seen? Uh, this is an interesting one. I don't know if this is actually true, but um, I think this does just explain framing a little bit more. The idea of, you know, a student who earns a twenty two thousand dollars scholarship who's undocumented versus giving money to the illegal immigrants technically the same story but framed in a completely different way to where the facts don't change but they do invoke two different messages i think this is a really good uh, um, video that explains agenda setting theory and framing i want y'all to watch so we talked a little bit about fake news and misinformation disinformation we need to be able to separate that and sometimes it can be very difficult and it's getting more difficult unfortunately so i want to introduce some resources to do that and i want to do a quick activity i want you to look at this screenshot you can pause the video if you want i want you to look at the screenshot and i want you to tell me why this is a fake news article it is not a real news article but i want you to tell me why and there's there's one very 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 key giveaway i wonder if you're going to be able to catch it so if you want to go ahead and pause the video and try to figure out why is this a fake news article. So if you give up, I'll go ahead and reveal. Check out the website. Check out the URL, abcnews.com.co. Remember we talked about imposter you know, websites that are posing as other legitimate websites. This is a pretty prop popular one if you see a website um, that appears to be legitimate, but then it has kind of that extra little at the end. Uh, just another helpful quick little graphic about how to spot fake news. We just mentioned, you know, consider the source. Is it from kind of what appears to be a, a nonsense website? Um, you know, is it a, a legitimate peer reviewed paper or is it, you know, news, news breaking now dot, you know, whatever. Um, check the date. If you're referring to an article that was six years ago, it's probably a little bit outdated and you're probably gonna look kind of silly. Um, consider, is it a joke? Is it so ridiculous that it it possibly, cannot possibly be real? Sometimes though it is still real. So th these are not absolute, but I think some of these can be helpful um, to just kind of spot fake news. This is another really good video to show how to find better information online. You will wanna be aware of this again, as you're getting into your professional positions and, and your media communication professional, but as your students. You're going to be writing research papers. You're going to do a couple of research papers for this class. And you want to make sure that the information you're finding that you're citing is legitimate. It's peer reviewed. Um, 
there are some people that say, you know, websites like Wikipedia, for example, are not reliable because anybody can edit them. I actually think that they're very reliable because anybody can edit them and because they're so uh, often reviewed by people that I think inaccuracies would be called out pretty quickly, but you can decide what you feel. Um, we're very lucky here at Temple. You know, the Charles Library has some amazing resources to help you with your research finding. Uh, just go to their website and you can check out the fake news resource page. You can look at some tools for fact checking. You can look at the uh, more information about tips to combat mis and disinformation to ensure that you're, you know, you're finding the right sources for your paper. Um, if you have never spoken with Christina DeVoe, she's a wonderful resource for all of us here at Temple. Um, and she's great for helping students improve their research. I recommend you connect with Christina. So those are some tools. Hopefully you do use them because I think that they're very helpful and all of us make mistakes and it's easy to slip up, especially like we said, things are getting even more hard to differentiate between what's real and what's not. And I think that they will continue to get that way. So let's try to take a glimpse into the future. Obviously, none of us can predict the future, but we can go based on what's been happening and we can make some, you know, probably very reason, probably very well reasoned predictions. Media bias. Media bias is a concept that you're going to discuss a little bit more in your discussion board for this week. Uh, it's defined as the bias of journalists and news producers within the media. It does relate to framing, but it's basically, you know, the selection of events and stories, how they're reported, how they're covered. Um, it's not a secret that a lot of news agencies, some would argue most of them, have some sort of bias. You could look at Fox 29, you know, Fox News, for example, is is very far on the right. Everybody knows that. CNN is very far on the left. There are some that are more in the middle. Um, there are some that are way more right, way more left, more to the extreme. They all have a bias in some way. They just they decide on what they want to cover, how they're going to cover it, the words they're going to use, the way they're going to frame certain things. It's also not always 100% certain the level of the media bias, and it's also not always in stone. Um, media bias can change. That is that is for sure happened. There have been agencies that maybe they used to be on an end of the extreme and they've kind of slowly drifted towards the middle or there have been you know news companies where they were always very objective, very down the middle, and then they've slowly kind of drifted into one end or the other. Um, one way that you can explore this idea of media bias is there is a uh, collection of what are called media bias charts. So there are some really awesome websites where they look at um, a news company, they look at the stories they cover, how they talk about certain things, and they can actually kind of estimate with a pretty accurate degree, where are they on the political spectrum? Are they hard right, hard left, or are they kind of semi right, semi left, or are they pretty, pretty central? And um, I think these are fascinating. I, I'm constantly looking these up because sometimes I like to decide for myself if I'm watching a news you know, agency, and I say, mm, they seem to be kind of left. And then I look it up and I turn out to either be right or completely wrong. Um, and you're going to be exploring this again for your discussion board. This is another company that does it. This is called Ad Fontes Media. Um, this one's way more in depth because you can actually zoom in and see um, some different kind of indicators, whether it's, you know, high on the fact checking reporting, low on the fact checking reporting uh, axis, or to the right or to the left politically. And uh, I really, I really like this. I think this is very well done. So let's go a little bit back in time uh, and talk about some, some rhetoric. Aristotle, one of the great you know, philosophers of, of the world, uh, he kind of coined the term rhetoric. It was his form of teaching and his teaching as it related to persuasion in his, in his book, his text, Rhetoric, he argued for uh, three main strategies of persuasion. You've probably heard this in the Com Studies 1111 class, ethos, pathos, and logos. They're pretty easy to define. Ethos is the appeal to authority. So when somebody's talking, if they want to touch on ethos, they will appeal to authority. Uh, they will try to make themselves seem like they're an expert. Uh, if I want you to believe what I'm telling you, I'm going to try to make you feel like I know what I'm talking about. So if I'm a doctor and I'm going to talk to you about some medical advice, I'm going to say, well, you know, I am a doctor. I've I've served on these boards and I, uh, I've done this amount of research and I've worked in the field for 30 years. And that might, you know, persuade you based on my authority to listen to me. 
Pathos is the appeal to emotion. So this is how well can the presenter speak to the emotion of the audience? You can use any emotion you think of. You can use fear. You can use sympathy. You can use empathy, passion. Uh, a good example, I think, of pathos um, persuasion is the ASPCA commercials with the Sarah McLaughlin music where it's the poor cat outside in the cold and it's snowing. That's a pretty hard appeal, appeal to emotion. Um, and then logos, the appeal to logic, considers how well the speaker, the presenter, can use facts, data, statistics, and figures to support the speaker's claims. So if a presidential candidate is doing a debate and they cite you know, facts and they try to cite data and specific numbers and sources, they're trying to appeal to logos. They're trying to, you know, make it irrefutable to argue with them because they're they're providing objective facts that, you know, numbers really, you know, they're saying numbers don't lie, right? The facts don't lie. So ethos, pathos, and logos, you'll hear them again. So it's good for you to have a, a routine understanding of the three and, and what they actually, um, you know, look at. So with those three areas of persuasion from Aristotle, um, does this mean that as long as someone that you're listening to appears to be, you know, credible, that they speak to your emotions and that they appear to use facts, does that mean that you should believe them? As we move forward, I, I do think it's a pretty safe assumption to say that it, it will become more difficult to separate fact from fiction. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you think that things are going to get easier. Um, because misinformation and disinformation are going to get called out more. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe one of us is right or not, but I, I think it will probably get more difficult. And I, I'm not sure where I stand on the media bias front. I'm wondering what you think. Do you think that media is just overall moving more towards the middle or more to the extremes? What what types of news sources are people seeking out? Are they seeking objective storytelling or are they seeking out sources that only speak to what they believe? Um, you know, the idea of an echo chamber, which we're going to talk about in a later lecture, the idea that I only want to be surrounded by ideas that agree with me. Take a few minutes to write down what you think. Do you think we're moving towards more objective reporting or more, you know, one way or the other? Um, will it become harder or easier to separate the fact from fiction? So that does conclude module four, fake news, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and media bias as well. I, I, these are some of the key terms we talked about. Again, the difference between mis and disinformation. It's very simple. Misinformation is just straight up incorrect. Sometimes it's a typo. Disinformation is deliberately spread wrong information to deceive people. Could also be any number of other, um, you know, reasons to do that. Fake news is false or misleading information um, presented as news all the way back to the 1890s. The agenda setting theory, this idea that the media is able to choose what they cover um, and therefore they're able to set an agenda. Whatever their agenda is, they can influence that because they can decide how they want to cover things. Uh, and sometimes they do that by framing. Media bias, the idea that news sources, journalists, they can be biased one way or the other. And they show that by how they cover certain stories, what they cover. Um, and media bias usually relates to what, what is their agenda. So they're very connected. And just one more time, rhetoric by Aristotle, three areas, ethos, the appeal to authority. If I'm speaking to you, I want you to think that I'm an expert, that I know what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna use ethos, uh, pathos, the appeal to emotion. If I wanna make you feel scared about something, I'm gonna try to scare you. I'm gonna try to make you feel excited. I'm gonna make you try to feel hungry, tired. I'm gonna appeal to your emotions. Uh, logos, the appeal to logic. I want to use facts. I want to use figures, numbers, data. I want to make it irrefutable what I'm telling you. So you will consider all those um, for a project. You will also consider the media bias aspect for our discussion board this week. I want you to use one of those media bias charts. I want you to use specifically the one from Ad Fontes Media because I think that it's really well done. You're going to choose three media sources that you use on a weekly basis. I want you to look them up. I want you to read where they fall on both of the X and Y axis. And I want you to consider um, you know, those areas. And why do you consume them? If you now see that some of them are quite biased or if they're completely objective, have you ever stopped consuming a media source because it was too biased? I'm very curious to read the responses to this week's discussion board. Quick reminders, please watch the agenda setting theory video from the slides and the how to find better information online video from the slides. I would definitely take some time to read through the resource page on Temple's website for the library. 
uh, and please complete the module number four discussion board. So thank you again. I hope you've enjoyed our lecture number four, and I will see you all next week.